Alex, hello. Hi, you get. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Uh, so I'd like to introduce you uh, a little bit before we uh, start. So uh, first of all, thank you all for joining our webinar titled uh, Responsible Business in a Time of Crisis, uh, which is organized by Center of Excellence in Finance, uh, founded under the sponsorship of uh, Akbank. Uh, I would like to welcome Professor Alex Edmonds, who is joining us right now from London. Uh, he was actually kind enough to give a seminar uh, at Jeff on corporate social responsibility when he uh, visited Istanbul uh, a couple of years ago in 2017. And we are privileged to listen to him again today. So uh, let me offer some introductory words for you. Uh, uh, Alex Edmonds is a professor of finance at uh, London Business School. He has a PhD from MIT and he was uh, uh, previously a tenured professor at Wharton and an investment banker at Morgan Stanley. Uh, he has spoken at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Uh, he has testified in the UK Parliament and he has given uh, the TED Talk, uh, What to Trust in a Post-Truth World, and also the TEDx Talk, The Social Responsibility of Business, with a combined uh, over 2 million views. He appeared on many uh, various TV channels and he has written for Financial Times, Harvard Business Review, and Wall Street Journal. Uh, Professor Edmonds has won numerous teaching awards, both at Wharton and London School of Business, and uh, he has been named to Poets and Quants, Best 40 Professors Under 40, and Thinkers 50 Radar. Uh, Professor Edmonds has recently published his book titled Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit, uh, which came from uh, Cambridge University Press. And today, uh, he will enlighten us regarding how companies can ensure that social responsibility is consistent with long-term shareholder value. So before we begin, I want to also inform our audience that we will have a short question and answer session after the uh, talk. You can type up your questions in the chat box during the talk, and uh, we will direct your questions to Professor Admins after his talk is over. So, uh, Alex, again, thank you immensely for being with us, and we're very, very excited to listen to you. Well, thanks so much, Hugo. It's, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation, and also for your hospitality a couple of years ago when I came out to, to visit Sabanshi. As you know, and as a professor, you give lots of seminars around the world, but I cannot remember being treated and hosted as, as generously as I was by Sabanshi. So I'm sorry that the webinar, that the pandemic has led to this being by webinar, but it's still nice to be able to collaborate. And thank you so much to everybody else for, for, for joining and giving up this hour to spend uh, with me. So what I'm going to speak about is responsible business in a time of crisis. And I think in order to do this, I want to explain what a responsible business is to begin with. Because while we might think, well, the answer is obvious, I might actually have quite a different view of responsibility to what we can typically think. Now, I don't know what it's like in, in Turkey, but in the UK, we were locked down for about three months. So let me take you at least metaphorically, away from your home offices and take you on a journey to another country. I want to take you on a journey to the Great Rift Valley. So this stretches across two continents from Lebanon and Asia to Mozambique in Africa. It has some of the world's highest mountains and has some of the world's deepest lakes. And one of these lakes is a lake called Lake Magadi, which is in the southernmost tip of the Great Rift Valley. Now, it used to be, now you might think it's hard for you to imagine this lake because you haven't been here before, but some of you might have actually seen the lake before. You might have seen it in the movie, The Constant Gardener, based on the John le Carre novel of the same name. And indeed, millions of people around the world have seen this lake because of the movie, but fewer than a thousand people call the lake their home. And one of these people is a gentleman called Emmanuel Saronga, and he makes a living selling and herding goats. Now for Emmanuel, it used to be that cash was king. So if he sold a goat, he would receive cash, and then he'd have to check that cash in case it was stolen. Then he would have to store that cash at risk of robbery. And then 
if he wanted to take that cash to a bank, he had to walk to the nearest bank and the nearest bank was one day away. So his life was really tough, but like he couldn't grace his goats in the greenest pastures. It would take him an entire day in order to um, go to the bank. So all of this changed in 2007 because of a responsible company. And that responsible company was Vodafone. So what did Vodafone do? Well, they launched this mobile money service called M-Pesa, which um, that, and, and what is mobile money? You might think it's like mobile banking. So with mobile banking, I have a bank account and I have to, I can operate the bank account on my phone rather than going to a branch. But mobile money is much more powerful because with mobile money, you don't even need a bank account to begin with. And that matters because many people in Kenya don't have access to banking systems. And so that made a huge difference to Emmanuel's life. But he no longer needs to deal with cash. He no longer needs to worry about being robbed. He no longer needs to worry about having his um, money being counterfeit. And he can graze his goats in the greenest pastures. It doesn't take him one day to put the money into a bank. And also his accounting is easy, right, because he is able to um, just look at his phone and this has a record of all of his transactions. And more generally than just Emmanuel, a study found that the launch of M-Pesa lifted 200,000 households out of poverty and most of these households were headed up by women. Okay, so that was one story about Vodafone. Let me now give you another story. And that other story, is about tax. So in 2012, Vodafone became the first telecoms company in the telecoms industry around the world to launch a tax transparency report showing how much tax they were paying to governments worldwide. And that's really important because in the telecoms industry, you could choose to locate your, your licenses in low tax countries. So I've got a question for everybody on this webinar. Thank you so much again. I really appreciate you bearing with me during the technology issues. So the first question is which of these decisions created most value for society? And the second is which of these decisions, if they were not taken, would have led to the most public outrage or worse than Vodafone's corporate social responsibility rating or reputation. Now, I'm not going to poll anybody because I'm pretty sure that most people would agree with the answer. So which decision created most value for society? It was the first one, right? Because by launching m -Pesa, Vodafone lifted 200,000 households out of poverty. But which, what would have happened if Vodafone had not launched m -Pesa? there would have been no public outrage. But you don't get in trouble for not launching an innovation. But the newspaper would have never thought that you would have had the possibility of doing this crazy thing of banking without a bank. So had they not done that, nothing would have happened. But what would be the effect if you aren't transparent on tax it could be massive, right? So indeed, two years previously, UK Uncut, a UK citizens group, reported that Vodafone had avoided £6 billion of tax. It was legal, but people said it was not moral. And around the same time, the Chancellor, George Osborne, unveiled £6 billion of spending cuts. And so you can see what the headlines were, Right, people said that you, the taxpayer, are suffering £6 billion of austerity because this greedy company is not paying enough tax. And this led to boycotts people didn't buy from Vodafone. So this is why my view of responsibility is quite different to most people's view. So responsibility is absolutely about doing no harm. But we don't want to be cheating on tax. We don't want to be mistreating our workers. We don't want to be polluting our, the environment. 
But you already knew that before coming on this webinar. Instead, I want to change our thinking about responsibility. Responsibility is not just about not doing harm. It's about actively doing good, engaging in innovation and excellence, things such as creating m -Pesa. Even though you don't do this to avoid a newspaper scandal, that is how much more social value is created. It's actively doing good rather than just doing no harm to avoid being in a scandal. And so this goes into the framework that I introduced in my book that you get mentioned at the start, which is we can think about the value that a company creates as being given by a pie. And that pie can be split to investors in the form of profits and society in the form of wages to workers. It could be think, thought of as taxes to the government or stewardship of the environment. And we often think that responsibility is about splitting the pie fairly. So reducing the blue and increasing the orange. And you could do this by paying higher wages to workers or paying more taxes to the government. And again, don't get me wrong, right? Absolutely responsibility is about fairness. But I want to shift our thinking and say responsibility must be more than that. Why? for two reasons. There's two reasons why thinking about responsibility as splitting the pie fairly is limited. One of these limitations is that it's bad for companies, right? It makes companies less profitable and therefore companies won't be willing to adopt this. And that's problematic because it might mean that companies will just not want to put this into practice. So as you will know, many CEOs signed the business roundtable statement about serving wider society. But many of those CEOs were accused of not putting it into practice. And if indeed, if responsibility is about making a company less profitable, then many companies just won't do that. And the second reason why responsibility can't just be about splitting the pie differently is that it's bad for investors. Now, many people might say, we don't care. Right, because we often think that investors are nameless, faceless capitalists. Investors are them, society is us. If we take from them and give to us, that is good for society. So any politician who says they're gonna take from investors and give to society, they will win a lot of votes. But I want to stress that investors are not them. They are us. What they involve parents saving for their children's education, Pension funds investing for retirees or insurance companies laying aside to fund future claims. So any repurposing of business must take investors seriously. So that's why my view of responsible business is that it's about growing the pie. So it's about actively creating value. So we indeed do want to increase the orange, we want to serve society, but the way we do that is not through giving them a greater slice of what's already there, but by actively creating value through innovation and excellence, and as a result, investors become better off. So why did Vodafone launch and Pesa? They did this genuinely because they wanted to solve a social problem of financial inclusion in Africa, but unexpectedly, they were able to monetize m -Pesa, and therefore investors became better. So this is my definition of responsible business. In the book, I call it pie economics. Now, you could either like or dislike this phrase, but forget about the phrase. Let me go through the definition. Responsibility is about creating value for society. Now, you knew that before coming on this webinar. So instead, I want to go through the start of this quote. You create profits through creating value for society. So that the way that you create value for society is not just to give greater donations, it's not just by giving them more money um, by donating to charity, but being innovative and being excellent, and so profits go up as a byproduct. So it seeks to create profits through creating value for society. But the other important word here 
is the word only. The way that you create profits is not through price gouging. It's not through um, paying workers too little, but it's indeed, it's said, it's through solving social problems like Vodafone and M-Pesa. Okay, so at this point, you might think, oh, well, everything Alex says, that sounds great. Responsible businesses can create value for society and be profitable, but it's a bit unrealistic. Like, it would be great if indeed ethical companies perform better, but is this wishful thinking? Where is the evidence? So this is indeed what the role of academic research is. That's what Yigit and I spend most of our time doing, is to provide rigorous research to see whether these things actually hold up in the real world. I'll take these slides because we're out of the interest of time because of the issues earlier, and let me get to the evidence. So this is one thing that I wanted to look at in some of my own research, indeed in the paper I presented at Sabanji a couple of years ago. I wanted to look at whether ethical companies actually perform better or are instead fluffy companies distracted from the bottom line. And so to do that, I needed a measure of how well a company serves society. So what I looked at was the list of the 100 best companies to work for in America, which is a measure of employee satisfaction, so how well a company treats its employees. So you might think, well, why do I focus on that? Why well, it's only employees, it doesn't look at the environment or customers. Well, I chose this list for two reasons. Number one is that the list was available from 1984. So I have tons of data. I had 28 years before I stopped the study in 2011. And that's really important. Why? Because responsibility is a new concept, right? So many measures of responsibility have only been around maybe for the last 10 years or so. And if indeed I did a study which looked at 2010 to 2019 and I found a positive relationship, you might be skeptical. You might think, well, those last 10 years were the years of an economic upswing. So maybe responsibility only pays off in an upswing. Right now, we are in a crisis. Maybe we can forget about responsibility. So what was interesting is that my data set was from 1984 to 2011. So it included the collapse of the internet bubble, September the 11th, the financial crisis. So I had both recessions and booms to make sure that what I was studying was not specific to an economic upswing. And the second reason why the data set was very important was that it was really thorough. So it looked at measuring responsibility, not only in terms of pay and benefits, but also in terms of pride in your job, camaraderie with your colleagues and trust in management. So what I wanted to do was to look at, do responsible companies actually perform better or are they just fluffy companies who are distracted from the bottom line? Now, to do that was, it, it's difficult because right, I've got Google on this list. Google was a company that treated its work as well and Google's done really well. But how do we know that it's just due to responsibility? It could be that the tech industry happened to do well or some other factor. So for every company on this list, I have to control for what industry you're in, for recent performance, for size, for valuation, and a whole host of other factors. And as we know, correlation doesn't imply causation. So I need to do further tests to suggest that it's employee satisfaction that causes better performance rather than better performance, allowing a company to spend more on its employees. So it took me four years to verify the robustness of the results and to rule out alternative explanations. What are the implications for you all as practitioners? I found that the 100 best companies to work for in America delivered stock returns that beat their peer, peers by 2.3, to 3.8% per year over a 28 year period, which is 184 to 89 to 184% cumulative. So this is 
serious stuff. Companies that treat their employees well, they're not just sacrificing profits, they're instead being profitable. So in the final 15, 20 minutes of the talk, I'd like to highlight the implications for practitioners. This is an academic study. The academics only mean that it's rigorous, but the academic study has a lot of implications for the practice of business. And so I'm going to divide the implications into two categories. So some of you on the webinar will be working for companies. And this highlights that creating stakeholder value, serving wider society, is not an optional extra. It is fundamental to the success of a business. So I spend a lot of time talking to companies. And often when I'm introduced, people will introduce me as a professor of finance. And the often is often surprised. They think they've misheard because often the finance department in a company is the enemy of purpose led initiatives. They think it's a waste of money. But what the research suggests is that any finance department with this mindset is not doing their job properly. Instead, creating stakeholder value should be an issue for the CEO, not the CSR department, right? Corporate social responsibility is often seen as something which could be delegated to a different department. But what I suggest is that this should be something central to a company because it's linked to long-term returns. And the second implication is to investors. So when I went to my first responsible investing conference in 2007, as a professor at Wharton, the investors at that conference were not mainstream investors. They were socially responsible investors who weren't just concerned about making profit, they were concerned about some other social objective, such as climate change or gender diversity. But what I'm highlighting is that even if your only goal as an investor is to make as much money as possible, which is fine, that's a laudable objective if you're a pension fund, you should still consider these social factors because they are linked to long-term performance. So why we care about employee satisfaction is not that we think companies necessarily need to um, sort of solve income inequality, but because this is financing material, a company does better if its workers are treated well. And this gets to now my next section, which is how to put this into practice. So what I highlighted is that responsibility is important, but how does a company actually practice responsibility? And so here I want to get to the elephant in the room, one of the most tricky issues with responsible business, which is how does a company make decisions, right? Because we know how a company makes decisions if shareholder value is the objective. You get, and I and other finance professors have been teaching this for the last 50 years, we use net present value. We use a spreadsheet to calculate the impact of a decision on shareholder value, and if the impact is positive, we take the decision. If it's negative, we don't. But if shareholder value is not the only objective, but we have other objectives such as responsibility, we need to find a way of making these decisions. And so in my book, I come up with three principles to guide us on how to make the decisions. I don't have the chance to go through all of them right now, but let me just go through the third one, which is the principle of materiality. So before I define materiality, let me explain what I mean by purpose, because that's been a subtext to my talk, but I haven't explicitly um, defined it. Now, often we think that the word purposeful is a synonym for altruistic, right? A purposeful company is one that cares about wider society. So, um, and so a purposeful company is just one which serves society. But that's not what the word purposeful means, right? If we think about the word purposeful, it means focused and targeted. A purposeful meeting is one with a clear agenda. If I do something on purpose, I do it deliberately. And so a purposeful company is one that is focused and targeted. It doesn't try to be all things to all people. 
So there's some companies with a purpose statements like this. Our purpose is to serve customers, workers, suppliers, the environment and communities and investors. That sounds great because you promise to serve everybody, but it's unrealistic because you're going to face decisions where there are trade-offs. So one example is Engie, the French energy company, which faced the closure of Hazelwood. So Hazelwood was the most polluting plant in the OECD. So if Engie closed Hazelwood, it would be good for the environment, but it would be bad for workers. So if your purpose was to serve workers and the environment, there's no way to make that decision easily. But instead, if purpose is focused and you focus on one or two stakeholders, then it is much clearer. So this is indeed what I mean by materiality. Materiality says there's lots of different stakeholders out there, but materiality recognises that certain stakeholders are more material to your business than others. For example, let's look at this, which is the sustainability accounting standards boards materiality map this goes through each industry and highlights what are the most material stakeholders so let's take the left column which is mining extractives there the environment matters a lot because if there is a flood then you are um, not able to access your mines but let's look at the second column which is financials Right, so here, the environment doesn't matter so much because if there's a flood, a bank is not affected. But what matters much more is social capital, customer privacy, data security, selling practices and product labelling. Why? Because if you're a company that doesn't have customer trust and you're a bank, you're going to be out of business. And so this is going to be the final um the final study that I'm going to show you is one which takes the ESG data set from MSCI, which is perhaps the best known data set on responsibility. And it takes companies that do well across every dimension. So these are companies that perform well on every stakeholder basis. And what they found was that those companies that do well on everything, they don't actually beat the market. They beat the market only by one and a half percent per year and that is not significant but instead if you take the companies that do well only on the material dimensions and do badly on the immaterial dimensions they do beat the market by 4.8 percent per year so this is striking because what it shows is that it's better to do well on only a few things than to do well on everything because if you're doing well on everything you don't have this clear materiality benchmark, you're not able to prioritize. So a responsible company isn't all things to all people, but it serves particular stakeholders which are material to it. And so my final slides before I get to the questions are going to think about how do we apply this to the current pandemic? So the pandemic, we've seen a lot of great actions by companies. And many of them I will call pie splitting actions. So those are companies which have taken actions to serve wider society to split the pie fairly. So these are executives and investors accepting their share of a shrinking pie to allow other stakeholders to not suffer so much. So in terms of executive pay, there are some CEOs, let's say Boeing and Airbus, which have, been, which have accepted no pay. Some companies are still paying their workers, even though they, they are shut. So Wynn Resorts, which runs hotels, their workers are furloughed, but they're still paying their employees. And there's some companies which are helping customers. Unilever, for example, they are donating 100 million euros of food and sanitizer to communities. So those pie splitting actions are great. Any company that does that should be widely praised. But the problem with viewing responsibility as being about splitting the pie is not everybody can split the pie. Not every bump company has a hundred million euros lying around to give. And what if you're not in the food and sanitizer industry, you don't have relevant products. 
So this is why I started this talk with the importance of Pi growing and with the example of Vodafone, sorry that it was interrupted by the tech issues. That highlighted that responsibility is not just about throwing money at a problem, but by innovating. And so what I think Pi growing means in this current pandemic is for a company to ask themselves, what is in your hand? So what resources does your company have and how can you use them creatively to serve wider society? And I think this is really powerful because it means that many companies can act responsibly. So you could be a company in an unrelated industry. Let's take Chelsea Football Club, for example. Right? They don't clearly have anything to do with the crisis, right? They have football. But what is in the hand is a hotel. And they're using that hotel to house doctors and nurses so that after a day at the hospital, they can stay in the hotel rather than to have a long trip home. What if you're a large company hit by the crisis? So let's say you're Qantas Airways. Your workers are furloughed. You'd like to keep paying them, but you just can't because you're going to go out of business because as an airline, your revenues have been hit. However, what is in their hand is a business relationship. They have a relationship with Woolworths, which is a grocery store in Australia. And that relationship used to be that if you went to Woolworths and you bought some groceries, you could then um, get some airlines. But what they've done is they've leveraged that relationship in order to allow furloughed employees from Qantas to work for Woolworths so they now still keep their jobs and keep their incomes. And what if you're a small company and you don't think you have anything that you can add? Well, let me give you an example of a small company that I'm a customer of. This is called Barry's Bootcamp. It's a brutal boutique gym. So David Beckham goes to this gym as well. And so they were obviously closed for many, many months. Um, but what did they do in the crisis? They don't have lots of money because they're a small company. But what they did is they offered free fitness workouts on Instagram, which were really valuable because many people were self-isolating at home. Now, you might think, well, that's not too surprising. Why like a fitness company offers fitness classes, but just online. But here's what the great thing was. Now, what if you are a desk worker at the gym? So you work behind reception. How can you help out in the crisis? Well, what it turns out, is that some of the desk workers are actors as their main job. And some of those actors, and if you're an actor, your income is volatile, so that's why they took the job at the gym to provide some stability of income. Now, if you're an actor, what is in your hand? Well, you're really funny, you're great at entertaining. You might think, well, how does that help during the crisis? Well, during the crisis, what we had was a lot of parents with their children at home, where because the schools were shut. And so what Barry's was able to offer was a Zoom storytelling sessions where they could tell stories to children and entertain them to take the out them off their, their, their um, them off their parents for an hour during an important webinar or an important call. So this might seem a small thing, but this makes a big difference just by thinking creatively about how to serve society. So obviously the pandemic is a really sad thing, but if there's any silver lining to the crisis, it's that we can think about responsibility, not just about doing no harm, avoiding a scandal, but actively doing good, doing creative things in order to create some new value, such as Zabanji launching this webinar with me, right? So in terms of do no harm, things can go wrong. Things went wrong earlier with the technology, so if the goal was to avoid failure, we would have launched this webinar, but hopefully some of you would benefit from the webinar and hopefully it's of interest. And the whole point of Sabanji launching this idea of having this webinar series, that is something which grows the pie and creates value, even though there's obviously risks such as technological issues. So I'm gonna hand back to you yet very shortly um, for the questions and answers, but just to say, as you get kindly mentioned, um, I just released a book about this called Grow the Pie, how great companies deliver both purpose and profit. And so why I wrote this book is that there's a lot of work on responsibility nowadays, 
But almost all of this is one sided. They're saying companies are evil and capitalism is evil and making money is not necessary. But that's really unrealistic. Right? Companies do need to make profits to survive. And what I wanted to show is that responsibility is something that can be fully consistent with hard headed business and long term success and profits. And this is not a pipe dream. This is based on a lot of rigorous academic research. Now, unfortunately, a lot of this research is written in a very boring way for academic journals. So the goal of the book was to make that research accessible in simple language to a general audience and brought to life with real life case studies and examples. And so that's where a lot of today's webinar was taken from. But anyway, well, thank you so much to everybody for, for their attention and particularly for all of you who stayed during the challenges with the, the tech issues. Let me now hand back to you get for the questions and answers. Thank you Alex, for your talk. So you can hear me right Absolutely, now. Absolutely, right? yes, the tech seems to be okay now. Oh. Yeah. So we can take some questions from our audience. So they can type it out, type it up on the chat box. Uh, but let me start with a question of my own with a couple of sure. questions. So this uh, thinking about short termism and uh, increasing the stock price or um, value of the equity of a firm is very entrenched for the uh, decision making. So this really requires companies hearts to change to take the framework that you're explaining into account. So how do you think that change could and should happen? For example, uh, how do you see the how do you see regulations role in all this? That's a, that's a great question. So I think one of the main things that needs to change is, is CEO pay. So that's where a lot of my academic research is on. Now, CEO pay is a very controversial topic, and there's many people arguing how it should be reformed, but they often look at the level of pay. So they'll say, well, a CEO in the US gets paid $20 million. That's too much. Let's pay her less. And so there's more to go around. But that's based on the pie splitting idea that if you cut the CEO's pay, you can give it to everybody else. But the amount that you can give is really small, right? 20 billion, 20 million dollars sounds a lot, but to the average firm size in the US, that's about 0.04% of firm value. So that's basically chunk change. But instead, what my work on pay is about is about reforming the horizon of pay making sure that pay is for the long term rather than the short term, because then if the CEO is tied to the long term, then she will think, well, how can I improve the long term value? And it will indeed be through treating my workers better and engaging with the investment. Because you're absolutely spot on, you get like, the main problem is, is horizons. In the short term, serving society does reduce profits, the pie is fixed in the short term, only in the long term can it grow. Then you talk about regulation, and with regulation, one thing that could be changing is quarterly earnings. So in the US, like companies have to report their earnings every three months. Often that gives companies only a three month horizon. But if they are to scrap that, which I believe the SEC in the US is thinking of doing, that's something which can allow invest companies to have a, a longer horizon. Um, to follow up on that, so in your book, you, you describe this them versus us mentality yeah. so it's like uh, it's as if there are these corporate people which are them and us which are the people let's say yeah and, however it's not like that as you explain because we are also the investors so like our mothers and fathers they have the, their pension funds in the corporations etc so that them and uh, us um, framework is not a reality actually so mm -hmm. uh, so what can we do as investors and more generally as citizens to have an impact on corporate decisions? Thank you. I think one, one main role is, and, and, and I would say this as a professor, is, is to get informed uh, and, and just to look at the data because like the, the them and us mentality is really popular because if you're one-sided, right, you can get a lot of support. So anybody who writes a book nowadays saying companies are evil, investors are evil, capitalism is evil, that book will sell very, very, very well because you like to argue that there's crooked people out there. But if you just look at the evidence, that's not the case, right? Even hedge fund activists 
which are some of the most unpopular investors, they do create a lot of value for wider society. So there was an article in Bloomberg recently about AC Milan Football Club, which is owned by Elliott, a hedge fund, and they're trying to take huge actions to get rid of racism, which is why if not just in uh, AC Milan, but also Serie A and football more, more, more generally. So I think the evidence shows that actually investors are actually adding a lot of value. I think more generally citizens to try to look at both sides of any issue. So often the media likes to portray everything as one-sided. So every CEO is evil. Yes, it's true. There's some CEOs who do bad things, but there's also some CEOs who do good things. And to try to look for more moderate solutions is good because why I think we're in a lot of issue with wider society and populism is that people often just only see one of those things. So I think citizens, before they take any action, before they post or share a story on social media, they want to look at is this balance? Because if it's not, it's, it's likely to be something which is just written just to um, be clickbait rather than to present an informed view. Uh, we have a question from one of our participants. Uh, he says, uh, which industries do you think will advance further compared to their competitors? Maybe uh, we can uh, frame this in terms of like, in what type of industries have you seen this grow the pie mentality being implemented and going forward, what industries will uh, be uh, predecessors for that? Yeah, so I, I can speak, speak from this from both an academic perspective, but also from a practitioner perspective, because I serve on the Responsible Investment Advisory Committee of Royal London Asset Management, and we have five sustainable funds. And so one industry that we are really positive about, it probably won't be too surprising, is pharmaceuticals, is healthcare. Right? Healthcare companies, they do make a lot of profit, but they do that out of solving social problems. But here, we also must be quite careful because there are ways of making money as a healthcare company by pie splitting. So in chapter one of the book, I talk about Martin Shkreli, who ran Turing Pharmaceuticals, and he would buy existing drugs and then increase the price by 55 times. And that was a really bad way of creating profit. So instead, what a healthcare company should do is to make sure that they are creating profits through innovation rather than just price gouging. And one of the important things of this is the access to um is drug access and pricing so with the coronavirus crisis that there, there will be some companies which will be the first ones to find the vaccine and they need to make sure that the vaccine is, is available at an accessible price rather than only accessible to the rich so pharmaceuticals but we need to look at their pricing a second industry um, that Zafra is asking about um i would say is technology so technology does get controversial because of Facebook and Cambridge Analytica. But I do think technology has a huge positive role to play because it, it really saves a lot of resources, right? Because if we can do our shopping by the internet, that saves physical stores, which just takes a lot of resources to construct. Technology right now is what was really critical in lockdown. It enables people to keep working, it enables us to have this, this webinar going along. And then I think linked to that, something like cybersecurity is going to be important. And I think finally, um, a, a, an industry which, um, well, I think has is, is, is obviously been hit now, but um, going forwards, I think will be important is anything more, more related to, I think, personal services, because these are things where technology can't fully replace. So there are things such as, say, on, um, uh, say, say, um, yoga and, and so on, or personal massage services, like urban massage within the UK. So they're providing massages in people's homes. So there are certain things where technology can't do everything. And so those are where if they're providing personalized services to very pe busy people, where you're having a massage in your own home, rather than having to go to a massage studio, I think that's where sort of busy people are able to, to benefit from that. Another question that came up uh, from our participants is, how can we understand whether the companies treat their employees well because the prof profitability is high or the profitability is high because the employees are happy? So this is a correlation versus causality question. I'm sure in your paper you've uh, controlled for that endogeneity, but how can you explain it in less academic terms? Yeah, absolutely. So, so what I look at is I look at the link between employee satisfaction and not profitability, but I look at the link with future stock return. So why is future stock returns important? The future stock return is the change in the stock price from this year 
to next year. So let's say causality was in the other direction. Profitability is high because the employees are happy, which is what Omer is writing. If profitability is already high, then the stock price would already be high today and therefore it shouldn't outperform going forward. So if I said find that the stock price rises in the future, it must be because the stock price wasn't so high today, and therefore it's likely that it's employee satisfaction that led to the future rise in the stock price, rather than the company already being profitable to start with. So more questions are uh, coming up. So uh, Mina Aksu, uh, a recently retired professor in Sabancı asks, shouldn't governments encourage this through, say, tax cuts for companies trying to increase the size of the pie? So, I, 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 yes, I understand the intent behind the question. I would say no, however, for two reasons. For number one, is that companies already have sufficient incentives to increase the size of the pie, which is that they're more profitable in the long term. So companies, in, it's in your own interest to treat your work as well, Right, because doing so leads to long-term profitability. And the second problem is with the tax cut, it's hard to know what to re re report. So what actually increases the size of the pie? You might say, well, let me give you a tax cut if you pay your workers higher than the minimum wage. But in fact, a lot of the important things that you provide to your employees is not just wages, it's on-the-job training, it's meaningful work, it's skills development, it is a delegation and empowerment, and those things are very difficult for a government to enforce. So the problem with a lot of these tax schemes is that there's a lot of ways in which like people will do things in order to get the tax break rather than doing it out of sort of general commitment. So my fear is that a tax motivation will lead to just basic mark compliance. It becomes a compliance exercise. Let's do the minimum possible to get the tax card rather than genuinely doing it because we want to do it. There's another question about causality. So does ECG make companies perform better or do well-managed companies choose to do more on ECG? I mean, this is a generalization on the uh, employee satisfaction, but do you have anything to add? Yes, yeah, so I can't talk about that with a materiality paper because that's not my paper, but I can say further about it with my employee satisfaction paper because I haven't spoken about the well-managed issue that you're mentioning, which is an important one. So what I, another test that I look at is I look at future analyst surprises. So what do I mean by this? Every three months in the US, companies need to um, report their quarterly earnings, okay? And before they do so, Equity analysts are able to are, will will predict what the earnings are going to be. Now, when equity analysts predict what earnings are going to be, they will have talked to management. Right? They know how well a company's well, well managed a company is. They spend a lot of time talking to management. What I found was the best companies do systematically better than what the earnings are predicting. OK, so even after taking into account how well managed the company is, which goes into the analyst forecast, these companies were doing even better than the forecast. And that's what's leading to the outperformance. OK, so maybe uh, last two questions. So one of the questions you already answered, like how to change, semi Mars questions. One question from here. Are there any other evidences for the outperformance of companies on other responsibility aspects, such as climate change? Yes, thanks, Rudy. So unfortunately, that then there's not. And that's what's really important is that a lot of people say, well, climate change is the order of the day. Every company should try to start taking action on climate change. But that's not the case. If you go back to the materiality paper, right, that shows that you only outperform if you do well on the material dimensions. So it's indeed true if you're an industry for which climate change is material, that you will outperform. But for other companies like banks, the best way that you can serve society is not necessarily serving your carbon, reducing your carbon footprint, but making sure that you're um, reducing customer data breaches. So like for me as a professor, like what is the best way that I serve society? It is not the fact that I bike to London Business School, rather than taking an Uber. It's the fact that I try to make my lectures relevant and interesting and practical rather than just theoretical. And I think that has far more of an impact than the fact that my carbon footprint is low because I, I, I bike to uh, London Business School. So I have one last question of my own. Sure. Which is maybe a little bringing to this Turkey or emerging market context. 
So as finance professors, one of the first things we also teach in finance classes is the agency conflict, right? The conflict between managers and shareholders. Do managers act in the best interest of shareholders? And this goes into your framework as well, growing the pie. Now, in emerging markets like Turkey, the, uh, re the central conflict is between actually large shareholders and small shareholders. Yeah. So how does that change the uh, grow the pie framework you're talking about? Yeah, so I so it's, it's true that it's a different agency conflict, but I don't think it changes the grow the pie idea. And that because what's critically about growing the pie is that a growing pie benefits all stakeholders. And so that's why it's different to the pie splitting mentality, because the pie splitting mentality benefits some and then doesn't benefit others. And so that's why um, the different nature of the agency conflict might matter. But here, if a company is creating social value, it's creating value for all investors, both large investors and small investors. And I think this is important because it means that there's something that investors should should get um, get behind. Because often we think, well, investors have different perspectives. A hedge fund will not work in tandem with an index fund because index funds can never sell. Hedge funds often only have a two-year holding period, but that's not the case. So in chapter six of the book, in particular, I look at the evidence that actually um, investors are able to um, work together, even if the investors are of quite different um, natures, because all investors benefit from, from growing the pie. Well, actually, one last question, uh, if you don't mind. OK, sure. So when Cole asks, uh, which firms will be more willing to willing and motivated to increase their pie? Will it be mature firms, or will it be firms with higher growth opportunities? Yeah, so I think it could actually be both types of firms. So I don't think you need to be a high growth firm. You might think with well, a growing firm, well, you've got greater opportunities to grow because you've got uh, new products that you can develop. But I still think that that um, that um, e even mature firms can make a big pivot. So again, growing the pie is not just about innovation. So this is trying to tackle Tolga's question as well, because it's not just innovation in terms of product innovation, coming up with new products, but in terms of process innovation. So you might innovate in terms of how you produce this. So Unilever, they are not a very um, high growth company. They make soup and soap, right? But what they're trying to do is to make sure that this is um, in a responsible, sustainable way, that they're not using, say, um, non-sustainable palm oil and so forth. So even if you're in a mature business, you can grow the pie. When you think about growth, it's not just being growth in innovation, well, certainly not product innovation. It could be, as Tolga might suggest, product process innovation, producing it in a different way. And so this is why I think even though I have emphasized innovation, why it's different from just normal innovation is that innovation might be innovation in terms of producing the product in a um, in a more sustainable way. And I do acknowledge, I know that we're out of time. There are a few other questions that we might not get time to go through, but if you just drop me a message on LinkedIn, I will commit to answering all questions. I really appreciate everybody um, who's joined in this webinar and was able to stay throughout the tech issues. So if you drop me a, a message, I, I commit to answering all of those questions. So thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Edmonds, for sharing your views about the relationship between social responsibility and corporate value. So uh, as uh, Alex uh, also said, you can find more information about these issues on the website of his recent book uh, at www.growthepie.net. And you can also purchase the print book, ebook, audiobook from that website. So uh, before we conclude this webinar, organized by Sabancı University's Center of Excellence in Finance, sponsored by Akbank, I would like to thank all our attendees for taking the time to participate in this event. And we will share this webinar in our uh, social media platforms in the upcoming days. And thank you for being with us. It was a privilege. Thanks so much again. And thank you very much to everybody for joining. Take care. Take care, everyone.